Welcome into the NFL Report. James Palmer, Steve Weich with you. I am Jack Steve. It's not because it's the man, the myth, the legend, Scott Palmer, my dad's birthday. No, it is because we have, well, I'm still excited about that. It's because we have a monster show on a Thursday for you. We have Jason Kelsey. I think I've heard that name quite a bit around the NFL oh, yeah. and maybe oh, pretty yeah. much every single entertainment and pop culture place you can find in the tabloids or on the television. He'll be with us for an entire segment. Laramie Tunsil, the star left tackle for the Texans, with us for an entire segment. In Baldy, if this show was taped on the moon on a Thursday night at 3 in the morning, I think Baldy would find a way to be on this show with all the offensive line talk. And also, the coach, Leslie Frazier, is going to be with us as well. Why is scoring down? Well, coach has an answer, Steve. This is a monster show. We're new, but this is the biggest show we've had since we've started this thing. Yeah, no doubt about it. First off, happy birthday to your father. That is awesome. Right. This is a huge show. And it's the thing that, you know, the more we get into our show and we develop this show, the smart talk that we have, the entertainment factor that we have, and Jason Kelsey and Laramie Tunsil, they're only going to help us with this, JP. But, James, we, we, we've, got a, we've got a, a big week eight coming up, right? We're nearing the midpoint of the season. And I want to get to these guys as quickly as possible. Beforehand, let's hit on a couple games that really have our interest. And they may not be the splashes and headlines, but I want to start this out by looking at this Tennessee Titans-Atlanta Falcons game. And here's why, JP. Mm. All right. Sneaky. T- Tennessee's going to be starting rookie Will Levis. And I think whether he play, whether they win or not, if he plays well, this may be the time that they turn the page away from Ryan Tannehill, a preseason storyline potentially Ooh. coming to fruition. And here's why I say this. We just saw the Tennessee Titans trade safety Kevin Bayard out. We're hearing running back Derrick Henry. We're hearing wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins' name in trade rumors out there. This might be time again for them to flip. And the reason why it's important is they're playing the Atlanta Falcons. The Atlanta mm-hmm. Falcons may have waited too late to find out what their quarterback Desmond Ritter is, right? They had opportunities to start him last year when Marcus Mariota Great was point. stalling, and they waited. And maybe Tennessee doesn't want to repeat that. And here is a binding tie to that. The quarterback coach for the Falcons last year was Charles London. Guess who he's the quarterback coach for now? The Tennessee Titans. Pick me. So maybe he uh, has I was say that. some insight on that. So, so we'll see. That's why that game's got my attention. What do you got, James? What I got, Steve, is a sneaky, sneaky game in western Pennsylvania. One that I will be attending. And that is the Jaguars visiting the Pittsburgh Steelers. I love this game. Now, I for some reason, this game. game's getting... Right? I love this game. This game's getting no love. Remember, we had Jeff Chidia on on Monday. He had 10 teams that he trusts in the NFL moving forward. Neither one of these teams were on that list. Good Morning Football was breaking this game down the other day, if you want to call it breaking it down. They were giving it no love. It had no juice. I think this game has a lot of juice to it. And I first looked at Jacksonville and where they stand right now at 5-2, and two, how they've turned things around after that trip to London, and now they're sitting atop that AFC South, Stephen, if they go and play, and this is what Doug Peterson has preached to his team this entire week, play in a physical environment against a physical team like Mike Tomlin's Pittsburgh Steelers, come out of that game with a win, and then come home, and you know who they host the next week? The San Francisco 49ers. Oh boy. Oh boy. And if they win in Pittsburgh, and then at home against San Francisco, I think that juice that's lacking, I think that's going to start come around for the Jacksonville Jaguars in the national perspective of where they stand. These are two teams right now, I, see, I think, Steve, the perception is they're not contenders in the AFC, but right now, as we've seen, nobody's blowing the doors off of anyone offensively with large points on the board. Leslie Frazier's going to talk about explosive plays a little bit with us later in the show. That evens the playing field a little bit in the AFC, and I think both these teams could be in the mix, specifically Jacksonville, if they come out of Pittsburgh with a win. I think that's a perception changer for the Jaguars. I I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, like I said, I love this game because I think these are two teams Mm -hmm. flying under the radar in the way the Jaguars are playing. The way Trevor Lawrence showed the toughness he played last week coming off of what looked like some type of knee injury. Remember he had that brace on, and and he played well the way he did. I, I, for I think. Rushing for I mean, I, I think this game is is fantastic. James, you were talking about juice and having no juice or having this show has a ton of it, and we, we are the juice, not Steve. going to delay. We are going to get to our special guest, and coming up next, he's starting center for the Eagles, and he's a media mogul, 
and the pretty famous Big Brother. Jason Kelsey back on the NFL Report after the break. Welcome back into the NFL Report. James Palmer, Steve Weich with you. That man in the middle with the best beard in football, Jason Kelsey, the <laughs> yeah. All-Pro Center for the Philadelphia Eagles. And I will say this, Jason, we've all known each other for a while. Now you are yeah. the host of the number one podcast in terms of sports in the world. This is show is also a podcast. How do we get to number two? Your advice, go. Well, um, trying to think of who else you guys can date maybe to get your ratings up. You know, maybe... Uh, <laughs> Uh, really, really get crazy out there. I don't know. You got to find. I'm trying to think. Of who's Dua Lupa? I don't know. What, 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 I don't even know who we're yeah. where we're at here. But yeah, you said it perfect. That'll help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That hey, we're both we're both happily married, man. I think all all three of us are happily married, so we're 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 good. Yeah. We're good, good. good. Um, so, so tell me, and, and look, for, I mean, you're I don't know mobile. anything for ratings, in all honesty. <laughs> yeah. She doesn't. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm 30 yeah. years in, bro. I'm not. I'm not messing with that one. So, and, and Jay, hey, Jason, okay. you know, but you, real quick, you were great. You came out here to the broadcast boot camp. You're absolutely awesome, and uh, taking your career off. So we, we love seeing you you succeed like this. But I got a football question for you. When I saw Let's you go. a couple weeks ago, uh, after you guys came out here, played the Rams. You were talking about, hey, we're co- we got to get close on our red zone issues. Once we get through that, that's the dam that we have to mm-hmm. break. You were four of six scoring touchdowns against Miami. Do you think you guys yeah. have 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 turned that corner? Well, it was certainly better, and I think that that's uh, we're going to continue harping on it. That's a number that we want to improve on uh, each and every week. But yeah, four or six, we will certainly take. Um, you know, Miami's defense very stifling. Vic Fangio give you all these different looks. They have great players. So you got to be ready for anything uh, in all of these situations. So I thought we had a really good game plan going in the red zone. Um, and, you know, for the most part, uh, did a really good job. Jason, I don't want to say I'm stalking you in some of these locker rooms, but I have to bring this up. Repeatedly, <laughs> I see whether it's a visiting locker room or it's your home locker room, you're not even changed yet post game. You're still in your uniform, and it's you, Jalen. And Brian Johnson, the offensive coordinator, kind of huddled in a corner. I remember seeing it in Foxborough. And it's maybe a 15, 20-minute conversation post-game. What goes on in that conversation? Can you kind of take us inside that little huddle you guys have right after yeah. games? Well, I mean, not necessarily that one in particular. But, I mean, after every game, especially losses or games where maybe either you or the offense didn't play as well as you would have hoped, you're you're trying to iron out mm-hmm. things right away. I, I think it's very important, and I think – uh, part of this is from what Stout teaches and some of the science behind things, but it's important to get the corrections while they're still fresh, while everybody's frame of reference of what just happened mm. is, is really concrete. Um, you know, if you wait even just a day, guys forget like little minuscule details that I think ultimately end up being important to remember when you're having those discussions. So, you know, we always try and do, um, you know, we, we, we sit with each other on the bench for a reason as an offensive line. We're talking to the other coaches throughout the game as an offensive line. And then after the game, it's important to, you know, reconnect and discuss, you know, hey, man, if we would have just got to this or, you know, that play really struggled because uh, mm-hmm. I, feel, I feel like this guy was playing this technique, whatever it is, I think when you get to those as soon as possible after a game, while they're still fresh in everybody's head, um, it leads to uh, people really having a better understanding of how things just went. To that point, talking about detail, I mean, of course, the big phenomenon with your offense is the brotherly shove. Yeah. But with you, but you as a center, I mean, again, being on the field and kind of seeing this myself, what is the actual, the precision, you snapping the ball to Jalen? Because the one thing people mm. I don't think take into account is the quarterback has to kind of be moving forward as you're snapping the ball to him to really get that momentum going. I mean, yeah. what is the, the the precision? How do you guys just have, have perfected that? Because there's a lot more going on that I think people yeah. understand. Yeah, we, we've repped it a lot. And, you know, it's not uncommon, um, and I don't want to jinx this, so I'll knock on some wood, but um, it's not uncommon to fumble a snap in a quarterback sneak. I did it. Yeah. There you go, James. <laughs> I think um, – Appreciate it. You know, it's, it's, it's not uncommon to fumble the ball in the quarterback snap for exactly what you were just saying, Steve, is that, you know, when you're moving – you're as soon as that ball is moving – 
you're moving forward or changing your leverage and bending down. And the quarterback yeah. is already moving forward to be able to start pushing. And um, if you do not rep that exact mechanism and all of a sudden the first time in a game you're doing it for the first time, it's going to feel weird. So it's important, even in practice, especially before you run in a game at all during the season, or if you're running with a new quarterback, to really get that feeling down with the guy. And, um, you know, it's not just the center quarterback, it's everybody across the board. You know, how we're hitting the blocks, where we're starting, where we're putting the point at, um, you know, who's working with who. Uh, you know, there's a lot of details and minute things that, quite frankly, I think we have a leg up on because we just run the play so much. You know, it's not a play that you get to rep a lot in practice. Uh, so each one of these reps in the game is a, you know, pretty substantial rep above the next opponent in terms of running the play in general. So I think, um, you know, all of these chances we get to run it in a game and, and to run it at full speed ultimately make us more detailed and more efficient at running the play in general. You talk about leverage, Jason, and I know you needed it yeah. in training camp when you have Jordan Davis and Jalen <laughs> Carter, the youngsters, going against you in the middle. But you also have another Jordan on the team and your offensive line mate in Jordan Mailata. Yeah. Give me the strongest Jordan on the Philadelphia Eagles because those are two of the largest humans, I think, <laughs> yes. walking in America right now. Man, um, that's a tough one to answer. I would say... I think based on weight room numbers, I think it's Jordan Malata. And at okay. pure size, and I mean, Jordan Malata is the closest thing to a like a Marvel superhero I've ever yep. seen like walking around. Like this guy, <laughs> he's got two web toes. He's got two web toes. I mean, it's, yep. it's like he was born next to a nuclear power plant. It's not like it, <laughs> this thing just happens naturally usually. He's, uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll never forget maybe his second, his first offseason coming back from offseason program, he comes back and he's 6'9", uh, 285 pounds he shows up at. And the coaches are all upset because okay. he shows up overweight. And then he goes and does a body fat percentage. Uh, they, they take his body fat percentage reading, and he's walking around at that weight at 20% body fat. And I was like a 23%. I'm like, we're really getting on this. Like, this guy weighs 100 pounds more than me. <laughs> And he's a lower body fat percentage than I am. This is like a different Unreal. breed of what we're dealing with as an offensive lineman. So I'll go with my man Jordan Mulata. Although I, I think all yeah. three of them can hold their own, no doubt about it. Yeah, and you know, yeah, and there's something, look, sure. and there's something in that Polynesian blood too, man, where they're just naturally yeah. like super strong too. So I'm with you on that. All right, I'm going to change gears since you're a media mogul, and, and James and I, we, we've watched your documentary. You and I, well, you and I were actually talking about it. it's a great oh, documentary, Kelsey on Prime Video. Thank you. And the thing that I really took from this is your like the humanity, and when I say that, some of the struggles that you went through with your family, having to walk away on your wife and beautiful young kids every day, the physical pain you had to get through, not being able to get up. If you can just take us to that part of even to this season where, you know, last yeah. season we saw you in the dock, you were contemplating retirement, even if this is it for you, just the daily humanity you have to go through the suit up to entertain so many of us on Sundays. Yeah, I mean, you know, that was a big thing that we were really trying to strike with the documentary. And I'm happy you said this, Steve, because the, you know, I feel like so many of the sports documentaries and things focus a lot on the game and the football itself. And uh, we really wanted to strike a chord uh, with everything outside of the game or everything that maybe fans don't see. And, um, you know, I think we tried to be as a family as open as possible, which uh, was rough at times. And um, and I think we tried to encumber, it, encumber as many things outside of the building and inside of the building to really give people a full grasp on all the narratives that are happening from media writers to coaches to your own family to all the things between health and um you know you know whatever it is you got going on and in 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 try and be as open and as authentic as possible through all of those things and um you know this year uh health wise um you know knock on wood I'm I'm in pretty good shape still uh, I will say like every time you got gotcha you again you know, Thank you. Thank you. Every yeah. time you walk away from your family, and I think anybody who works for a living who's busy understands this and can relate with this, you know, it's tough. And, you know, the older my kids get, 
um, you feel like you're missing a little bit more. Like when they're young and still figuring out their personalities and whatnot, you you want to be around them all the time as well. And then, but once they start going to school and they're doing soccer, gymnastics, they're, they're starting to, you know, really become aware that dad's not there um, at times. I think it is harder for sure. Um, but outside of that, you know, I think, you know, we feel really good with where we're at uh, as a team. Uh, we're, we're winning, which makes all of these things a lot easier. There's no question about that. Um, and I have, I mean, beyond uh, the greatest wife in the world uh, who really, you know, helps me uh, cope with all of these things that much better. And, uh, you know, without how strong of a woman she is, I, you know, I wouldn't be able to do any of this stuff. So awesome. that helps out. No doubt about it. Right on. Jason, after you say that, I don't know how I'm leaving Meg for Dua Lipa after you, you know, so eloquently <laughs> deliver that. I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to do that in any stretch. Uh, but I appreciate oh, just you ruining our chances of catapulting this podcast. But I, I do want to say the documentary is brilliant. Our mutual buddy, Connor Barwin, did, a, did an unbelievable job. job with you on, on this as well. And, and I kind of want to just press one more time kind of into that where you talk about your, your family and everything that you have. I look at yeah. everywhere right now, whether it's a tabloid or a television, you're there in a sense. Yep. You're, you're making another Christmas album, which is great. And it's for Chop in Philadelphia, which is phenomenal. And you guys are yeah. coming out with another one of those. Everything that's on your plate and and constantly yeah. a lot of this is because of the way we started this, right? With, with, with Taylor Swift. You've never even met the woman, apparently, from what I hear. Yeah. But yeah. everything that's on your plate... Do you ever feel like at some point this season it might be too much or do you have to capitalize or I don't know if that's the right word. This is a window where all of this happens and this may not last forever. Yeah, uh, you know, we we took on a lot last year and it ended up working out really, really well for both Travis and I at the end of the season, although we did come mm -hmm. up one game short. Um, you know, I think it is a lot and I think the way we've justified it as a family is that, uh, you know, this is going to be over pretty soon here. You know, if it's this year, yeah. which it very well could be, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we're ready to go when, when football's done um, and that, you know, we're getting all of these different opportunities and things to figure out what it is we want to do in retirement. And, um, and then on top of that, uh, just enjoy the last – time you have left with the guys you have i mean the the christmas album mm -hmm. big reason we did it last year you know i didn't know how many how many if there's ever gonna be an opportunity to do that again with two teammates and and my former teammate connor barwin and a bunch of philadelphia musicians so you know when these opportunities mm -hmm. come up you realize that you know the closer you are to the end of your career being um that the opportunities to do these fun and engaging things with fans and and, and friends is going to be less and less and um, you, you, I think you realize that, and you want to make sure you want to do them that much more, uh, because you know when it's when it's done, it's it's not going to be there as much. So, I think yeah, both of those things uh, at the same time cause you to want to one figure out what what it is you want to do and take on these new and, and, and fun uh, challenges, but then two, uh, you know, do them with guys that you know maybe you're not going to have the opportunity to do them with in the future. So yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Listen, we want Great to see you stuff. do everything, in all honesty. Yep. It's all been a home run, <laughs> including playing football, which I wanted to continue as long as possible, selfishly, as a kid from the suburbs of Philadelphia. <laughs> well, I'm going to keep doing that as long as uh, everything's holding up pretty good and we're still having fun, which I can guarantee you right now we're having a lot of fun. So uh, looking forward to awesome. getting back out there this week uh, with the guys. And um, I wouldn't mind if maybe – you know the the Kelsey name kind of took a little bit of a dip down. I feel like ah. we're we're running on coals right now. We're, <laughs> nope. we're too hot. We gotta nope. we no. We gotta cool down hot? a little. No, we're milking this <laughs> cow. Hey, we are milking this cow for the show. <laughs> Thank you so much. Pre appreciate Bro, good that. Raise your spike. Good yeah, luck. Good luck. That. <laughs> right. Hey, Jace, we love you, bro. Thanks so Thanks, much for brother. taking right. time, man. Good luck. Appreciate both of you guys. Yeah, love you guys. Take care. Yeah. How awesome was that? And more offensive line talk when we get back as we are joined by Texas left tackle Laramie Tunsil and those red hot boys down in H-Town on the NFL Report. First and foremost, the, the free agents that Nick signed, man, he's cooking right now. 
he, he's really cooking. He got some, some great players coming into the locker room to also contribute to the team and help them win. And speaking of the draft, like, let's just say we have five picks, 11 picks in the draft, man. The sky's the limit for us. Like, we can really get this organization back on track and get it rolling. I believe in Nick in the front office to draft the best player in this draft and to help us win games. So I'm, I'm very excited, whoever they pick at the number two pick and the number 12 pick to come in here and help us win games. I'm excited. I'm ready to get it done. Like I said, I view myself as an X factor for protecting and a mentor for, for those guys who ever come in. All right, welcome back to the NFL Report. That voice you heard, that was Laramie Tunsil before <laughs> this year's draft, championing Nick Casario and drafting the right players. Uh, Laramie, you joined James Palmer and us. I think Nick Casario nailed it when you're looking at C.J. Stroud, <laughs> Will Anderson, Tank Dell, Henry To'o To'o, Leading your team in tackles, uh, I, I think he did pretty good, huh? Yeah, I think he did a good job for sure. And this is not the first. This is not the first rookie class he did a good job with. I think the previous one he also did good a good job with too. Yeah, <clears throat> I think Nick is Nick is also a guy that's behind the scenes and does a very good job of what he does. Laramie, so much of this is surrounded by the guy you guys took first. Uh, in this draft, second overall pick in, in C.J. Stroud. What I keep reading about, obviously we've seen his play on the field, but I'm curious about the relationships that are getting built behind the scenes. I keep hearing about Taco Tuesdays. We're watching, you know, Zombieland over there. Have you been over to C.J.'s house? I feel like this is a regular thing he's trying to do over there. Yeah, this is a regular thing that he does, man. He, he does a good job at, you know, bringing the whole team together. Um, the first thing I said when C.J. walked into the building, I was like, the, the leadership that he has as a young player is unbelievable. I think that's one of the first things I said when I met him. I was like, bro, your leader skills is off the charts, you know, and I think that's something that we needed <clears throat> in a franchise quarterback is somebody that's a consistent leader and a damn good player on the field. So, you know, you talk about leadership. One thing CJ has said about you is, I can't believe I'm saying this here, you're, you're like the OG in the locker room. It what he said, it's, he said it's just your actual <laughs> presence. You know, we know you were out for a couple games, but he said your actual presence is the one thing that's really kept things together and helped you guys win three out of the last four. Yeah, man, I just, um, I think my biggest role is to try to, you know, um, lead guys with my play. And, like, I'm not a hoorah guy, you know, a, a loud guy. I kind of just pull guys to the side and just chop it over them like that. I feel like that's my role in this team. Laramie, I'm curious. Steve mentions you as the OG. I won't say that. You're much bigger than me, but what I will say is you've been around for a minute in this league, and you've been around for a minute in Houston. I don't want to talk about the past and what that building was like, but how different and where is it now? <clears throat> it's crazy how it is now. Just We brought a lot of good players in, a lot of good coaches in to change this whole program around, and it all started with D'Amico. You know, D'Amico came in here with unbelievable energy. Mm -hmm. I think I said it every time when somebody asks about him, um, how consistent he is as a head coach. I think something that this program needed for a long time. You, know, you, you talk about the way things have gone and, and just him getting his hands around this organization, but you're winning. <laughs> you're winning ball games, Laramie. I mean, again, you were nicked for a while. You come back. Titus Howard comes back. The offensive line has really taken a, a different shape. Is that one of the biggest things that's being credited for the way this offense is played during this winning? I guess you guys won three of the last four. I think it's not just us. I think it's just the whole offense. Um, and it starts with CJ and it trickle down to the old line, to the receivers, to the tight ends, to the running backs. I think everybody's just buying in to um, what the OC uh, Bobby is telling us to do. And everybody's buying into each other. You know, we always want to, we play for each other. I think that's the that's the biggest thing with this year's team. Like we don't we want we don't want to see our brothers. We don't want us to feel like <clears throat> we letting our brothers down. So you know, we try to play hardest every snap, and that's what we've been doing these last weeks. Laramie, I, Laramie, I feel like anybody outside of Houston, a casual football fan, says Bobby who. Like, I feel like a lot of people don't know who Bobby Slowick is. I had a chance to talk with him during training camp. I was kind of – didn't know where I, where I stood with him, and I was kind of wild in our conversation. Can you can you kind of describe your offensive coordinator now that you're kind of a quarter away into the season and what he brings to your unit? He's another he's another guy that's behind the scenes, but he's a mastermind. He'd be, he be dialing it up. He really does. He's – in, in my opinion, <laughs> yeah. he really does. Like, he'd be dialing it up. In my, in my opinion, I think he's – one of the top OCs in the NFL. Wow, first year doing wow. this. Hey, Laramie, you, you've played on playoff teams, and I'm not going to sit here and ask you to say, <clears> is, <throat> is, 
is, is this a playoff team? But do you see some of the characteristics, as young of a team as you guys are, of some of those playoff teams you've been on? I don't I don't like to speak too soon, man. You know, that's I'm I'm a superstitious guy and I don't like to speak ahead, but you know, as long as we play good ball and stay consistent, you know, buy in, I think we'll do do just fine. Laramie had a chance to talk to Brian Baldinger before we were doing this interview, and Baldy said, I hate watching Laramie's film. I can't stand it because it is so consistent. The first snap <laughs> that I watch him is exactly the same as the last snap that I watch him in each game. What's your take on that consistency that, that Baldy's talking about and that you obviously strive for? And that's <clears throat> that's actually one of my biggest things that I, I harp on is staying consistent. No, no matter the circumstances, if we're down up, I just like to stay consistent the whole game. And when I'm taking notes uh, during the week, I always put at the top of my paper is consistent. You know, I, I have to stay consistent with mm -hmm. everything I do. Run game, pass game, screens, doesn't matter. Like, I like to stay consistent and just keep a level head throughout the whole game. Larry, we also have uh, Eagle Center Jason Kelsey on this show. And you see them run that brotherly shove play, whatever it is. They do it well. Not everybody does it well. As an <laughs> offensive lineman, like, what is the importance if you guys yeah. ever get into that turtle shell to execute that perfectly? You talking about the tush push? Yes, the tush push. That, the tush yeah, push. Tush push. <laughs> I, I, listen, I, yeah. I seen teams. I seen teams around the league try to do the tush push, and nobody executed like the Eagles are doing it, man. I, I don't know what's the secret with Jalen Hurts and uh, Jason Kelsey. I don't know what they're doing, but. They, they they got a rolling for sure. Is it something, Laramie, you guys look at as an offensive line and you kind of go, what are they doing? Like, what? Because you have a bigger quarterback. CJ's a pretty big dude. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's something you could do. It, in facts. I think we we actually try to dissect that play and try to figure out how they're doing. Like, is the offensive line getting a four point stance? Like, we talk about this actually every day and try to dissect the play and yeah. figure out how we can do it. But, I think the biggest thing is just try to do our own thing and try to execute it the best way we can. Hey, Laramie, right, right before we go, I got to ask you, you have twice negotiated your own deal <laughs> to be the highest paid tackle in the NFL. Why I love did you it. Do, yeah, why did you decide to say, I, I got this, I can do this myself. It's not a complicated thing. I just like, I just like to be the pioneer of my own ship. That makes sense. Try to be the CEO of my of my business, yeah. and you know, I have good guys around me. I have Lalu Sandy that helped me with the contracts, and I hired a whole bunch of uh, lawyers to look over the contracts, and it made the process easy. But <clears throat> it goes it goes back to uh, Nick Casario and D'Amico making everything easy for them too. I love it. I love it. That is Laramie Tunsil, the left tackle for the Houston Texans, apparently Baldy's least favorite person to watch on film uh, because of his dominant consistency. Play in and play out. Laramie, thank you so much for joining the NFL Appreciate Report. Appreciate you, Laramie. Appreciate it. And Baldy's going to get a chance to react to what Laramie Tunsil had to say, what Jason Kelsey had to say, and he's going to comment on this hard-hitting rookie corner in Devin Witherspoon. He brings up the name Ronnie Lott. What? More on the NFL Report coming up with Baldy. Welcome back to my favorite segment, Baldy's favorite films. Baldy, this almost seems like a theme. It needs a theme, doesn't it? It needs some music yeah. off the top, yeah. you know, something going out there to really get us so. going on Thursdays when you join us, right? You know, and so what, well, what I, I love about that, this James. segment so much. There's a lot to talk about. Listen, there is a ton to talk about because what you do also is you, you love watching these interviews that are always on before you on Thursdays. And, and the tush push was a big discussion. Obviously, Jason Kelsey's at the middle of it, but Laramie Tunsil saying they dissect it but they can't figure it out yet. Are there different ways Philly does this, Baldy? Yeah, you know, look, I've talked to Stout about it. I've talked to, uh, you know, I'm friends with a bunch of the guys up there. And, you know, like even when Carson Wentz was the quarterback there, they were 34 or 36 on quarterback sneaks over a period of time. You know, mm. and the one common denominator is Jason Kelsey, the center. It all starts with him. His ability just to get lower yeah. than everybody else and get the push started, how he – how he snaps the ball, where the ball is. Um, they, they give you different alignments, James. I saw uh, Lane Johnson unbalanced yeah. over next to Jordan Mulata on the other side of the line of scrimmage. 
Um, the one thing that they, they, they really concentrate on, and Carson told me this years ago, uh, when he had a quarterback sneak against uh, the Washington Commanders and he almost scored a touchdown on it, was if they don't get your legs, if they don't get Carson's mm. or, or Jalen Hurts' legs, a guy that deadlifts 650 pounds like Jalen Hurts, he's going to be able to have that push. And so it, it starts with J- Kelsey. It leads to Jalen. They don't get to you. Just watch it. Like, nobody's grabbing his legs. And so the momentum is able to continue and, and really, the push is able to continue. Well, I love you breaking down that because, you know, some of the changes in alignment, like going unbalanced with Lane Johnson, that, that changes the defensive alignment and their keys, yes. what they have to read at the snap. So that does open up certain things. But I want to flip it to the defensive side of the ball, to a player you, you are just loving after watching film for the Baltimore Ravens, Justin Matabuike. What is he doing for one of the best yeah. defenses in the NFL? Well, they might be the best defense. See, there's a, a, lot, a couple of teams right now, Cleveland, Kansas City, they're all vying for it. You put it different stats around it, but they've given up six touchdowns in seven games right now. Uh, that's good on, on any measure. But, you know, they lead the league in sacks. And, look, they've gotten a big help, I think, from genevian has been good, Van oy has been good. But the one guy that keeps showing up every week is Matabuike. He's incredibly powerful and explosive. He was coming out of college, but now he's in his third year. And he's kind of figuring it out. And when you watch what Mike McDonald is doing Mm -hmm. and how their blitzes complement their pass rush, um, the different fronts that they give you, I I just feel like Matabuike is a guy that is right on the verge of exploding into one of the more dominant interior defensive linemen. They move him around, they'll line him up over the tackle, inside, like in a variety of places. But he's winning wherever he goes. And it's clear when he gets on a, a player's edge right now, like he can push the pocket like the great ones on the interior can. I think at one point, Baldy, I think they were giving up a point per drive, essentially, is what it came down to, which has been phenomenal on this right. Ravens defense. And they've had injuries on that defense, too, specifically in the secondary. Yeah. And, and they've been able to battle through all of them. These guys are coming back now. That's the thing we're getting a chance to see as they continue to put this defense together. How about sticking to that side of the ball? Devin Witherspoon. Uh, a member of another pretty good defense in this league. This is a young player, Baldy, that is reminding you of a guy from uh, from the olden times for me, well, I guess. Um, I don't want to date anybody well, for too him, much. Look, but... <laughs> you, 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 look I, I, I hesitate to say, we're talking about Devin Witherspoon, the rookie from Seattle. Mm-hmm. He's number 21. He plays outside. He plays inside. But honestly, you can't take your eyes off him. He's just a magnetic player. And I have not seen a corner hit like this like hit when he hits you like he hurts you like he puts a thump on you now like now this is a pick six of course but you know I mean he cracked a couple receivers that's still pretty good from the Arizona Cardinals last week where you felt like I hope that player had his mouthpiece in otherwise <laughs> teeth are going to come like chiclets they're going to be spitting out these teeth the way he's hitting them he's just rattling bones and like I don't you know, like he did the same thing in Illinois so I made the comparison I haven't seen a corner like, I know Ronnie Lott was, you know, the gold standard for how you play physical football in this business. And, you know, Ronnie eventually went to safety. But like, I, I haven't seen – there's no comp for me about a way a corner mm. hits the way Devin Witherspoon hits. And I'm going to Seattle this weekend to do a game up there. I, I, I call him, you know, Spoon NATO. Like, he's a, he's a tornado, you know, of <laughs> just fury, of power. I can't wait to talk to him and meet him and just see – like, is he just this calm guy that's real laid back and then he transforms into this player on the field? Switch. I don't know because I haven't met yeah. him, but I'm looking forward to saying hello to him. And, and I love it. And he's doing this to some of the rules that were taking away from corners. Remember, corners could, can't come out and force on an offensive lineman anymore like they used to, like some of the big hitters back yeah. in the day. Let's go to another, to an inside linebacker who is thumping his way into Baldy's favorite film watches down in Atlanta, Nate Landman, who's also got a great story behind him, Baldy. He's got a great story. I'm sure, like, you know, I mean, you know, born in Zimbabwe. His dad was a rugby player, grew up playing rugby, all that stuff. Undrafted player out of Colorado, Steve Wright. Uh, makes the teams a free agent last year. Troy Anderson gets hurt this year. He steps in. And honestly, he's playing great football. He was great against the Bucks. He forced that fumble last week in the third quarter. But, you know, you look at some of the impact hits he has. Yes. And... You look at 
his relationship, Steve, and how Atlanta's playing defense. And Steve, you know the Falcons as good as anybody on this side of the of the ledger here. I can't remember the last time the Falcons were a top 10 defense. That's what they are now. They kept the Bucks out of the end zone and the red zone. They're playing good at every level. And, and so, like, I'm studying the defense, what they did against Tampa last week, and Nate Lambert just keeps showing up. He just keeps popping. And that's, you know, that's, that's just me sitting back. I'm not looking for a play. Like, he just pops off the screen. And he looks like he's getting guys lined up, and he's working with Ellis as his partner. And really, this is the best I've seen Atlanta. Like, the, the additions of Anya Mata, Calais Campbell, to go with Grady Jarrett, to go with the good corners. Like, they're looking pretty strong right now as they sit atop of the AFC South. Paul, you've been to Zimbabwe, right? I would assume. I, I had a chance to go to Zimbabwe. I <laughs> went to Madagascar instead when I was in South Africa. So I, I actually have not been there yet, James. It's on the list. Wow. Wow. I was going to put that I hear, on I, that, I, hear no. I hear that monkeys can't swim, but in Zimbabwe, <laughs> they show you how monkeys get across the river. And it's just something I got to see. Oh. The way they swing themselves I across it. and flip. Love so it. I, I, I just got to see it. Yeah. Yeah, that's got to be an in-person type of thing. And, and if you were in person yeah. watching Christian Darasau work against Bosa Ooh. this past week, Baldy, that was a work of art. I'm not sure if he was like a monkey swinging across a river, but he was definitely doing his <laughs> job on an NFL football field. You know, Christian Darasau is now, I mean, he's really coming on. He's playing great football. He's healthy. Um, his, his punch and his hands are marrying his feet. And so he plays really low. Like, he plays low in his stance. He's got mm. great knee bend, and he's shocking people. And he, like, he, you know, he shocked Nick Bosa last week and knocked Bosa off balance and knocked him down to the ground, finished him off. It's always a great test when you're going up against a guy that's, you know, one of the premier defensive ends in his whole business. You kind of want to measure yourself against him. But I don't think it really makes a difference who he's going against right now. I feel like Christian Darisol mm. can line up there on the proverbial island, and he can – Pitch a shutout or really limit the effectiveness of the great edge rushers in his business right now. He's just he's just playing at that kind of a level. Wow. Ball, and I want you to tie – I hate hitting you with double-barrel questions, but I want you to tie these together because you talked about Darisaw. We saw Cameron Bynum, the safety, come up and have two picks of Brock Purdy to seal that game for the Vikings. So if you can talk about Bynum, but do you also feel that maybe Minnesota is poised – to right the track because they lost a lot of one possession games just because they kept fumbling the ball. Yeah. Well, you know, Cam Bynum, you know, opening possession of the game, knocks the ball right out of McCaffrey's hands. You know, it stops right. that possession. You know, and then he finished, you know, the 49ers mm-hmm. had a chance to go down the field and win the game, 22-17, two times in a row. And Bynum comes up with the interceptions, and he leads the team in tackles. But, I, you know, we were talking off the air before we got started today, Steve. But if you look at what Brian Flores is doing, uh, at first, early in the season, I thought, ah, this is just a blitz-happy team. You figure out the blitz, you're, you know, they're only blitzing to cover up their weaknesses. And now I look at them, and I go, okay, Jordan Hicks, you know, Metellus, you know, you, you look at Danielle Hunter, Danielle Hunter, he leads the league in sacks. You look at different pieces, Hunter Harrison Smith and Cam Bynum on the back end, and you go, they're really playing good defensively right now. They're really keeping the score down. They're taking the ball away. And then, you know, you look at what Kirk is doing offensively, and you lose Justin Jefferson, but Addison steps up, KJ Osborne steps up. Like, that team right now, they were a better team than the 49ers on Monday night. Yeah. You couldn't have said that a month ago about the Vikings. But, you know, it's not about records. It's about stacking wins. And they've stacked two, and they got a chance to go to Green Bay this week and get number three and another division win. And you... I've been on a 1-5 team that turned things around. We fell short of the playoffs, but we won eight of our last ten. It's all about confidence and stacking wins. It's not about records. You stack enough wins, you'll play in January in this business. Buddy, I want to throw this at you at the end. We wanted to talk to Jason Kelsey about it, but we had 90 different things we wanted to ask him and only a limited amount of time. Howie Roseman and going and getting Kevin Byard and what you've seen from this Philadelphia Eagles team, ability to just get team, get players – specifically veterans at any point in the calendar year, whether it's Sonomic and Sue or Linval Joseph or Bradbury a couple years right in camp. What is it about what Howie Roseman does in terms of just kind of swiping these players at any point in the year? Well, this goes back. You go back to 2017 when they won a Super Bowl, James. 
Like I had a personnel director mm-hmm. under Howie on that staff tell me in August, before the season started, count, Baldy, you just count. We're going to make ten moves before we get to the postseason. And they made nine before they mm-hmm. got to the Super Bowl. And then I think they made one, like, right before the Super Bowl. They, they did ten. And so Howie's picking up the phone literally. He's doing this, and he's just, who can I shake loose? Like, what team is struggling right yep. now? I could, like, Kevin Byard's a Philly guy, a two-time All-Pro kid. I knew him when he was at Middle Tennessee State. Like, I can't imagine a safety in this business right now coming in and helping the Eagles out more than what Kevin Byard will do. You put Byard and Slay and Bradbury with that pass rush, I mean, the, the, the takeaways are going to come. They're going to be coming Philly's way. Mm-hmm. Congratulations to Howie. And the mentality that they have, that they never stop trying to improve the roster. Yeah, look, Howie's going to That's continue awesome. to do it with Jason Kelsey and every, all the other pieces they have. The Eagles are going to be there. Baldy, much respect. Love the insight that you're bringing. Now, up, up next, former head coach and defensive coordinator Leslie yeah. Frazier on why scoring is down and how defensive fronts are combating guys like Laramie Tunsil. Back on the NFL Report. All right, the NFL Report has been loaded with offensive linemen today, so now we bring in former head coach, former (laughs) NFL defensive coordinator, and former starting defensive back Leslie Frazier and coach right off the bat. You, Laramie Tunsil, yes. one of the most athletic tackles in the game. Jason Kelsey, yeah. arguably the most athletic center in the game. From what yes. you have seen over your years, how have teams and defensive linemen tried to combat the rise in athleticism we're seeing along offensive lines? Because there are no more fat guys in the NFL. Oh, <laughs> no, you don't. You don't see the, the <laughs> popular uh, offensive lineman that you saw when I was playing. It's it's completely changed, but. Yeah, you're right about uh, trying to find the athletic uh, defensive lineman to match up with the athletic offensive lineman. I know from a defensive standpoint, we were always trying to find the best matchup for us on defense. And after we took a look at the quarterback position and tried to determine where he was and and what his skill level was, the next thing was how are our matchups on the offensive line versus our defensive line. And across the league, Steve and, and James, teams have begun to allocate more money to their defensive line. I think uh, over this past year, like mm-hmm. 13% of, of team salary cap went to the defensive line. So everyone is beginning to realize if there's going to be a mismatch, it's going to be our defensive line versus that offensive line. So people are putting money into pass rush. Charles, in order to slow down these offenses, you have to be able to win with four rushes rather than have been bring, having to bring five or six, which makes you vulnerable uh, in the secondary. So people are allocating money uh, to their defensive front to be able to match up uh, with some of these offensive line, uh, offensive linemen. One, one, more, one more on that, Coach, I'm curious about is, as opposed to trying to bring a, a fifth rusher or a sixth rusher, being able to have athletes that are flexible to play inside and outside on your defensive line, to find those matchups that you mentioned, is that almost yeah. more valuable so you don't have to bring somebody extra that you have guys like Chris Jones that can go inside and outside Great that can point. find those matchups for you? Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, I think earlier before we came on air, I, I mentioned that, you know, one of the things we were always trying to find out is who's the weak link on the offensive line so that we could put our, our best rusher up against and you, and, and best rusher up against him. And you see the Cleveland Browns mm-hmm. doing that all the time with Miles Garrett. Them moving him all yeah. up, up, all up and down the the, the offensive line uh, for matchup purposes. And we did the same thing with a Von Miller. Uh, we did the same thing with a Greg Russo in Buffalo. Uh, so yes, uh, to your point, James, if you have a guy that's that that's ver- that versatile, it gives you an advantage when it comes to getting after the quarterback. Coach, scoring in the NFL is is lower than it's been in twelve years. The average score per game is you know twenty one point seven points per team. What are you seeing as to why scoring is down? Yeah, you know, it's a, a, a few different things, uh, Stephen. You you know in our league, um, you know, it's all about points. I mean, that's what drives ratings. I can remember sitting in the owners' meeting and hearing uh, the owners talk about the importance of scoring points. I remember uh, Bill Polian doing a whole presentation on why uh, 
uh, points were important uh, when it comes to viewership. So the league is, is, is really emphasizes scoring. And rightfully so, that's what the fans want to see. They want to see points. And now points are down. And there are a few factors in, in my mind as I take a look at it. I think part of it is when you look at the explosive play rate, that's down. Uh, uh, through week one mm. through seven in 2022, there were, you know, each team had about explosive plays uh, in the first seven weeks of, of, of well, uh, one through seven. Well, now you fast forward to 2023, that number is down to about 55 plays per team. So the, the explosive uh, uh, plays, the chunk plays, offenses aren't getting them at the same rate that they were. Now. And then you combine that with the fact that in our league, we're starting probably around, there, there are seven quarterbacks uh, in the league that are in their first or second year starters. That contributes as well because they're getting their first opportunity going against some of the you know, best defenses week in and week out. And one of the biggest factors that, that really sticks out to me is the number of first-year coordinators uh, with their team. Uh, currently, there are 16 first-time coordinators wow. uh, with their team wow. in the league. So, so you think about that. I mean, that's, that's a lot of news coming in, introducing their system uh, to a new group and trying to get it up and going in a hurry. And that that presents its own challenges in itself. So uh, those are some of the factors that I think are contributing to points being down. And, and to go back to what we talked about with the pass rush, uh, you know, I, the, the defensive line the, on paper this year, and even with the numbers they bear out, is a little bit ahead of the offensive line. When you look at the sack total across the league, that, that number's up through one through seven as well. Remarkable. That's the last thing defensive players and defenses coaches want to hear, Coach, is that scoring's down and the league doesn't like it. Let's have another couple of uh, penalties or People calling to go against us People as a are defense. People still watching. <laughs> so, so, so things aren't going yeah. our way. And speaking yeah. of defense, let's close this out, Coach, with, with talking about the Kansas City Chiefs defense. I've done each of their last two games. And, and when I talk to coaches on the sideline, it is this is the best group we've had in the Patrick Mahomes era in Kansas City. Why are you seeing Spags' group so successful this season? So so I wanted to know that from Spags. Uh, you know, you, he and I have a, a long history going back to our days with the Eagles. So I asked him, I said, what what do you what do you think it is, man? Because ordinarily it's been the offense kind of carrying the defense, as you know, James, uh in, in Kansas City. Yep. That's not the case in 2023. And Spags pointed to made some interesting points. He pointed to uh the continuity that they that they have uh, on their defense. They've got a number of guys that are returning from a season ago uh, that have been in their system yep. uh, for multiple years. He, he felt like that continuity made a difference in the success that they're having here in 2023. And then he pointed to the leadership that they have uh, in each room, in their defensive line room, in the linebackers room, uh, and with the secondary as well. He said they have tremendous leadership, You know, guys that are really echoing uh, what the coaches are saying and that, that's making a big difference. Then finally, he said, the last thing is our secondary and our linebackers are really working mm. well together and making us a better team because of that, which, it, which you know, it, it helps our, our defensive line because of the way our secondary and linebackers have such great chemistry. So a combination of the their secondary, uh, which enables their defensive line to go to work, and then vice versa, when the defensive line is working, it makes the linebackers and secondary jobs as w easy as well. So they've got a lot of good things going. Mm. Uh, Spags is really excited, and I'm excited for him as well. Coach, that, that's really great you talk about linebackers yeah. and secondary because the communication between those two levels in the passing game today is huge. And, JP, you pointed this out before the show. The recent addition of defensive end Charles Amenehu to that group mm -hmm. and the way him and Chris Jones are playing off of each other is great. James, we got 10 seconds, and we got to get out of here. <laughs> yeah, it, it, listen, you saw one sp specific play. Joe Cullen, the defensive line coach, told me in the locker room, he said, watch these two play off of one another with the length that Charles Menehu has off the edge, the way he can blow people up and they can play off of Chris Jones and one another. This defense might get even better. And so many guys are drafted into it, Steve, right? That's the big part of it. Most of these guys are draft picks on this defense. They've grown in the system. Yeah, absolutely. Coach Frazier, we want to thank you. Jason Kelsey, awesome. Laramie Tunsil, Brian Baldinger for the biggest NFL report ever. Coach, we'll see you soon. JP, everybody else, happy Let's week go. eight.